The, uh, this is going to be, I hope, a conversation about innovation. I promise you it'll be over at 1 o'clock sharp. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Surely, after all that introduction, you have a question. I'm going to wait till I get one question. Just to break. Who's going to break the ice for me? Yes, please. Why InfoWorld? Info yes. Oh. I was a visiting fellow at Cambridge University, and a t publishing tycoon named Pat McGovern called me up and said, I think it would be a good idea if you would run InfoWorld. And it um, took me about a week. I was, at, at Cambridge, I wasn't allowed to work or make money. And I was getting tired of that. And as a publisher, you can work really hard and make lots of money. So I made the switch. And, and I learned how to sell advertising. I sold $100 million worth of advertising every year. And it's really, it's as complicated as electrical engineering. So the, I'm from the south, uh, Brooklyn, and, and all along the southern Long Island, which accounts for my accent. And we have an irregular second person. Called, we say yous. And I understand here you, you say y'all. But it's the same, exactly the same thing. So I, I may go back and forth. Uh, so I'm going to, this is the 42nd edition of, my, of this talk. I've given this, this is the 42nd time I will have given a talk under this title, although it's different every time. And it'll be different this time because you're going to ask questions. And that's going to make it different. Any other questions? Yes. It's a very old and important question, and uh, there are books written about it. I refer you to Fumbling the Future, but my answer to that question is we were a monopoly, and we didn't have a competitive bone in our body, and we entered the computer business, which is fiercely competitive, and we had our lunches eaten. There are many other explanations, but I think that's the, the core one. Uh, uh, later, I will talk about monopolies, and um, I don't think much of them even though one of them was my benefactor for eight years, so biting the hand that feeds. Yes? Uh, in one of your articles, you mentioned uh, you would have worked with IBM differently in, had you known to uh, sell slash market better at, at that time when you first met with them. What would you have done differently? So the question had to do with uh, Ethernet, which is my baby, and it was uh, for a long time going to be killed by IBM's alternative technology called Token Ring. And to their credit, IBM gave me two chances in 1980, to, uh, once in uh, a Research Triangle Park and once in Fair something, New Jersey, to uh, convince them to adopt Ethernet. And, and they paid me $2,000 each time. I remember that because I had a check for $2,000. But that's all I got was the check. I did not get the order. That is the... Uh, uh, I was apparently insufficiently skilled at speaking and selling, and I could not sell IBM on the proposition of, of um, adopting a technology that had been developed by another company near New York called Xerox. So let me, uh, um, let me get started here. This is, um, I'm fond of saying this, this PowerPoint, which I have used variations of 42 times, is my first PowerPoint. And the irony there is that I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. And then for 20 years, I didn't use it. And then I adopted it for this. And I adopted it because I see that if you use PowerPoint, you can win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I got into energy from internet because of Susan Hockfield, the president of MIT, who uh, at an event on May 3, 2006, declared that MIT was going to solve energy or help solve energy make it a priority. And I'm, a, I'm an alum and a, and a trustee and a team player. So I signed up. And for me, the hard part was, what would I do in my day job? I was a venture capitalist. And of course, what venture capitalists do is invest in companies. So I started investing in energy companies. And that's a, a very extended list of the various energy companies that I've gotten involved in through my, uh, through my, with my partners at Polaris. And were I uh, still a venture capitalist, I would now spend the rest of our hour discussing how cool each of these companies is in as much detail as you wanted. But I'm not going to talk about this. I was just showing you this is how I manifested uh, 
uh, that interest in energies, begin investing in energy companies. Uh, but in my heart, I'm still an internet guy. This is a picture of the internet in 1974. By then, I had been working on the internet for five years. And the thing to notice about, two things to notice about this diagram. One is, you see those circles? Those are not cities. Those are not universities. Those are computers. That's how many computers there were on the internet in 1974. And what do you notice about the state of Texas? <laughs> I, I, what's that? It's big, and, it's, uh, and I thought for a while maybe Kirtland was in uh, Texas, but it's not. It's in New Mexico or something, whatever one of those states to the left is. Um, but I had a, pro uh, so as I began investing in energy, my problem was I came from the internet space, and all the energy guys, including a bunch of you here today, will resent the fact that an internet guy has presumed to enter the energy space. And that's exactly what I've done. So I had to find some way to justify that intellectually. And the way I did is I began to make, I picked up an old analogy. The analogy had been made previously between information and energy. So I said, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to see if I can develop some special angle wisdom in energy by taking what I learned in the internet the building of the internet, which I claim took 65 years, and apply it to solving energy. So an old analogy. And uh, so I began with the internet, and I noticed that the internet had been used to build the internet. It was one of those virtuous circles. The more internet there was, the easier it was to build more of it. So perhaps we could use the internet to solve energy. An obvious way is now that we have the internet, we have this, uh, we have this huge collaborative intelligence machine that we didn't have before the internet, that we can now use to get six billion people working on energy. We can, and I'll return to this point later, but we can also use the internet as a massive substitution for transportation. Why did all those people go to Davos to talk about saving energy? <laughs> Think of all the jet fuel their G5s and G4s consumed landing there in Switzerland. Why didn't they use video conferencing to have the Davos conference? Uh, so that would be a use of the internet for solving energy. We could also use the, internet, the Internet's innovation infrastructure, the venture capitalists, the, the um, university laboratories, uh, et cetera, which all came together to build the Internet over 65 years. Why don't we just redirect that huge infrastructure towards solving energy? And some of that's happening. And what I'm doing is I'm using the Internet as an analogy, so uh, yet another an analogy for how to innovate energy. Another question yet? Oh, I heard your talk the other day, so now we're even. So I decided to do this analogy, and I called it Internet, which is sort of a play on Internet. And there it is, uh, using this analogy, because I really want to solve energy. And by solving energy, I, we want cheap and clean energy. And I figure it's going to take about 65 years to do it, because that's how long it took to do the Internet. So how many of you have heard this expression, those of you who, uh, those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it? So I went on the internet and found the guy who set, first said that, George Santayana. But he didn't actually say, he, he said something that's a paraphrase of that, referring to the past. What he said about history is written there, a pack of lies about events that never happened by people who weren't there. My only defense in this presentation is, I was there. I continued, I typed Santayana, I mistyped Santayana, and I found Carlos Santana, but he also had something wise to say about energy, and, and there it is. Now, my wife's a, a history professor, and she'll be coming here to UT in September, and she said, if you're going to do history, you better have an era. So what was the Internet era? And looking at this audience, most of you probably think it was founded uh, with uh, Facebook in 2004. Uh, Al Gore is often given credit for inventing the internet. But you see, the Gore bill was passed in 1991, which strikes me as a little late to be the uh, beginning of the internet. Uh, you could go back to my favorite year, 73. That's when Ethernet was invented. And the current protocols of the internet, TCP IP, were invented in uh, the summer of 73 in and around Palo Alto. The cell phone was also invented, arguably, in 73. But where I like to go is all the way back to 46, where the 
because arguably the transistor is what enabled the proliferation of the internet, gave us things to connect to it, allowed us to build it economically. And what I also like about 1946 as the beginning of the era is that's the year I was born. So the internet and I and the transistor are kind of all born at the same time. And that's where I get the number 65 years. Now there is, we can argue about whether the internet really goes back that far and it's semantics. But I think there's a lesson here. The internet is not a Manhattan Project. I've been to Los Alamos. The Manhattan Project took three years. It was an engineer, a successful engineering project, I guess. Uh, it's not even uh, the space, the space uh, mission to the moon, because that took 10 years. It took decades to build the internet. So by analogy, if the internet is any guide, it's going to take decades to solve energy. And that's a different mindset than the shovel-ready mindset that you've heard. We're going to solve energy. We're going to dump all this money into shovel-ready projects. And we're going to solve energy lickety-split. And we have to because the world is coming to an end, so we better hurry up. I think that is the wrong mindset for solving energy. And at least that's what the internet teaches. The internet teaches that it takes a long time to solve problems, infrastructural problems like information and energy. And one of the problems with things that take decades is that our minds get stuck in mindsets, in taxonomies, uh, which is often called hardening of the categories. So in the early days of the internet, we had some pretty funny categories. Categories that were obstacles to progress and innovation because we thought about the internet in a certain way. For example, in those days, the, the telephone network was provided by, largely by AT&T, and they owned everything connected to the network, including the telephones. And so we thought there was no difference between the telephone network and the, what's called the premises equipment. But after 1968, those became two separate categories. And then we could connect thing to, things to AT&T's network, like answering machines and modems and ultimately the internet. Computers and communications were then two categories. In those days, computers were uh, from IBM, largely. And IBM was regulated by the uh, Antitrust Division, Department of Justice. Communications was largely AT&T, and they were regulated by the FCC. The FCC held hearings to decide where to draw the line between computing and communications, because they didn't want to get caught regulating the wrong thing. And right after they finished drawing that line, the internet came along and erased the line, because there is no difference between computing. The communi communications is provided by computers, and the things that are communicating are computers, so that distinction went away. And then there's an enduring trichotomy that was quite damaging to the pace of innovation. Voice, video, and data. So voice on the left was telephony, and it was provided by AT&T. And now even that picture is before my time. You notice there's no touch tone on there. Uh, and then there was video, which was synonymous with television, and that's a picture of HD snow. But you have to be pretty old to even know what snow is, because uh, they don't have it anymore. But we had snow, a lot of snow, and that's the HD version. You know, you can stretch things in, um, in PowerPoint. And, and data processing was conducted on devices on, like that one on the right, which was the initial terminal. The Internet's first terminal was an ASR33 teletype, just like that. But that false trichotomy pers has persisted to this day. In fact, you're probably familiar with the phrase voice, video, and data the integration of voice, video, and data as if they're separate. And they all became, in essence, the middle thing. Uh, they converged. And voice, well, actually, voice and video became data and, and therefore uh, were integrated. So let's look at energy. How many of you are in favor of corn ethanol? Just raise your hand. Perfect record so far. <laughs> Who the hell voted for corn ethanol? <laughs> So in a, you know, a, a frenzy of um, uh, biofuels, we all went to Washington and we convinced Washington that corn ethanol was the way to go. And we thought that animal feed and people food and fuel for automobiles were separate categories. And that we could futz around with the price of fuel and somehow there would be no impact on the price of feed and food. And what did we find a year or two later? We screwed up feed and food with the same subsidies because the Iowa farmers, and I suppose it's Iowa, is there any corn in Texas? I don't know. 
So I, I haven't asked the corn ethanol question in Iowa. <laughs> the good news here is at least we're wasting, uh, we're not wasting the money in the Middle East here, we're wasting it in the Middle West. So this is, I claim, a categorization error. We believe there was a categ strict categorization here that did not exist and it evaporated as soon as we tried to mess with fuel. Another lesson that one gets from the internet is that you learn about movements. The internet was a movement. And by movement, I mean a social, a social change associated with godlike people, with dogma, and uh, Vin Cerf, uh, the you know, god of the internet, his slogan was, IP on everything. Inter I'm sorry, internet protocol on everything. <laughs> and then associated with movements, there's a, and I came up with this term, inquisitorial religiosity. So during the internet bubble, if you said, well, maybe pets.com isn't a good idea, people would say to you the seven most feared words. You just don't get it, do you? <laughs> well, energy is a movement, too, not one movement. The internet wasn't one movement. The internet was many. For example, this picture is the, the ethernet's uh, movement, and you notice the cable, the big coax cable in the middle. We don't use coax anymore, but we did then, and it was yellow. Yellow was the color of Ethernet, and all the people with Ethernet t-shirts, they were yellow, and the cables were yellow, and anyone who, the token ring people were hated by the Ethernet people, and we were a movement, and yellow was our color. So energy is a movement too, and I bet you can guess what color it has selected. Green. Let's talk about green. These are the people on the left who often show up as greens. Now they're in favor of environmentalism, that's good, but then they tend to be against trade, capitalism, America, technology, nuclear energy, hydro, tidal, wind, solar. The people who have adopted the color green are basically against all the tools that we're going to need to solve energy. So I claim we need a new color. And incidentally, I wasn't the first person to think of this. Tom Friedman asked this same question. And I, I hasten to add that because if, if I'm doing something Tom Friedman did, it's OK with everybody. Uh, so I'm kind of associating with the New York Times a little bit just to, so no one will get too angry with me. So Tom Friedman asked this question that I'm asking. So what would be a better color for energy? Black. 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 Oil's black, coal's black, silicon's black, carbon's black. If you've ever seen silicon, you know that it's not black. Silicon is sort of mirror color. That's one of its problems. It reflects too much light. Anyway, black isn't a color. How about white? Well, if we could increase the albedo of Earth, you don't like white either, no? The problem is if you increase the albedo too much, you get snowball Earth, which uh, stabilizes at minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, even in Austin. So, and anyway, white isn't a color either, so I uh, decided to use science. And I did this experiment, which is the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll between 400 and 700 nanometers, and you will notice that even plants don't like green. But that leaves blue and red, and uh, there's a picture of Earth uh, from NASA, and what color is it? Blue, and Ma NASA calls this the blue um, marble. The oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface. Their average depth is 12,000 feet. 90-some percent of life of living space is in the ocean. When we solve energy, it's probably going to involve the oceans, I figure. So blue, so blue would be a good color. But let's not fight. Let's let the environmentalists, environmentalists have green. One of those of us who are focused on solving energy will take blue. And this is a, another annoying, I, did I tell you I'm from New York and therefore I'm annoying? <laughs> so this is like my third annoying speech and you've been very polite to me and have not shown any annoyance quite yet. You're not sh you've felt it, but you haven't shown it. <laughs> this is annoying because every university in the United States, and I've been to most of them, has a department of energy and the environment. One department that does energy and the environment as if that is one topic. Now, there is an intersection put a fine point on it, it's CO2. But all the rest is different. So if you had a, a cure for global warming, we would still have an energy crisis. 
And if you somehow had infinite energy, we'd still have a climate change crisis. So I claim these are separate topics, so it's okay if we have separate colors. I hope I've convinced you now to stop being green and um, be blue instead. Anyway, speaking of colors, and in the interest of time, uh, this is a uh, mostly black picture of Earth at night. It's several pictures of Earth at night knitted together. You've all seen this picture before, right? Typically, the person showing this picture to you, especially if you're American, they want you to feel really bad. Because look at all that energy emanating from North America uh, out into space, completely wasted. And so you are bad people because you're doing that. And our goal, therefore, should be to make the whole Earth black, dark. Because we, that's the solution to our problem, is to somehow eliminate all energy. Anyway, that's the wrong mindset. But you see this, do you, you agree with me? The picture who show this, people who show this picture are trying to make you feel bad, so you'll do something. Let's go back to the internet. When the internet was first conceived, there was at the time a thing called the information explosion going on. Books, newspapers, magazines, television was new. And all, all we had for bandwidth was the 100-year-old ca uh, copper cable plant of the AT&T company, which many of us feared was uh, not up to the task of serving the information explosion. So our first impulse was conservation, conserve bandwidth, make, use it efficiently. So we came up with data compression. Ethernet is a bandwidth sharing mechanism. So the first impulse of the internet was conservation and efficiency of bandwidth. We have now taken decades, we've built the internet. So do we use less bandwidth today than we did before we built the internet? Like half, we use half as much thanks to all that compression and stuff. About the same amount of bandwidth you think we use? 10 times? A hundred times, a thousand, I, I think you could argue we're using a million times more bandwidth than before we built the thing. So, if the internet is any guide, when we finish solving energy, we are not going to be using less energy, although that is the mindset uh, frequently encountered in today's world. We need to prepare to have cheap and clean energy, and when we have it, we will have it in what I like to call squanderable abundance. That is a lesson of the internet for energy. <coughs> cheap and clean energy in squanderable abundance. And I say cheap and clean as if it's one word, cheap and clean. Not just cheap, not just clean, but cheap and clean. Because neither cheap nor clean works alone. They have to be together. Am I against conservation and efficiency? Of course not. This is my new car. It, I traded in a 12-cylinder Mercedes for a three-cylinder Mercedes. And that's not my wife driving the car. <laughs> my wife, uh, who just won in her age group in the Austin Marathon, is better looking than that. So I drive a smart car. I also have my big car, uh, which I use for hauling things around as a mini. <laughs> uh, speaking of cars, if you look at the internet and energy, one of the earliest impacts, I think, is going to be in transportation, and it's going to be with automobiles. This is a bit of a digression, but it's one of my favorite digressions. It seems pretty clear, if you look what happened to the objects connected to the internet and what it did to transform them in size and capability, that when we're done with um, the, uh, the internet, uh, A, the cars will all be electric, B, we won't drive them anymore. We'll save a million, year, a million lives a year by not driving them anymore. And we probably won't even own them. There'll be an app for that. I need a car. I need a two-seater. Da da da. Psh, off you go. In my lifetime, which I, uh, by the way, since that, my red car, that's a signal I'm having a midlife crisis, <laughs> a red convertible. Uh, so that means, uh, I'm, I'm about to turn 65, that means in the next 65 years, no more DMV. Which, that, usually get a round of applause on that. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the consequences of looking at the internet in the context of energy is we can now, as I mentioned earlier, 
begin to substitute trans uh, communication for transportation. So one of my current mottos is transport your bits, not your atoms, and save energy by doing that. Now, there were some surprises in the building of the internet, and we should take some, uh, uh, we should try to learn something from them. The platforms, the computers that were connected by the internet, the earliest ones looked like, are signified by the upper left, which some of you will recognize. I refer to that as cellulosic computing. <laughs> Punch card. That, you know, they fit perfectly in this pocket. You can put to-do lists on them and so on. But they used to be the principal. So the world was making the transition from batch process mainframe computers, principally made by IBM, over to interactive time-sharing systems, principally made by DEC at the time. And, and so the, in the early days of the ARPANET internet, the beginnings of the internet, we all thought that we were crusaders because we were moving to time-sharing. And then no sooner did we get started time-sharing than uh, uh, Silicon Valley opened up shop and we ended up with personal computers. And now that we're finally getting personal computers mastered, we're moving to cell phone platforms, smartphone platforms. So that's a surprise. In the course of, so we started out to network one thing and we're now networking other things, and not just eight of them, but uh, a billion a year of them are coming out. There will be surprises like this in energy. That is, trans we will think we're doing one thing and we're going to end up doing another if the internet is any guide. This is a, a particularly emba embarrassing surprise for me. So I, ha I had possession of the sixth packet switch on the internet, number six which turns out to be six and octal. I was living in octal then, but it, the coincidence that six and octal is also six and decimal. And every month I had to report the traffic out of imp number six to my sponsor, ARPA. And I had an ASR33 teletype attached to this, and I would ask it to print the report. Where did the packets go? And it would say a certain number of packets went from MIT to Harvard, and a certain number of packets went from MIT to Stanford, and a certain number of packets went from MIT to UCLA. <laughs> and at the bottom of the page was the biggest number of all, the number of packets going from MIT to MIT. And this was embarrassing, because we hadn't built the ARPANET to carry traffic within a building, because generally speaking in those days there was only, you were lucky to have one computer in a building, let alone two. So we referred to this in our, we wrote this term, this was called incestuous traffic, and we did not report it to ARPA, because it was embarrassing. <laughs> Three years later, this was my business. It was called land traffic, which has a completely different um, tone than incestuous traffic. <laughs> and we started making messes like that on the right. That's a surprise. We should expect surprises in energy. There will be some. Here's an even bigger surprise. In those days, we thought we had the AT&T copper in the ground, which was a 100-year infrastructural investment that could not possibly be replaced in any kind of time frame. So we were stuck with it. So local traffic was all going to be carried over this pitiful copper wires from AT&T. But long haul, we could use the new technology, uh, microwave and uh, satellite. So long distance, wireless, local, copper. Does that sound familiar? Is that the way we do it today? No, it's flipped. We now use wireless Wi-Fi, which by the way is wireless ethernet. Uh, so I'm taking credit for Wi-Fi right there. <laughs> so it's wireless locally and it's wired long-haul optical fibers because in the course of building the internet somebody invented dense wave division multiplexing and now that's the way we communicate on wires long distance. This is called the Negroponte switch. Uh, Professor Negroponte first noticed this big surprise. So there'll be some big surprises like this in energy and then of course there are these these are three surprises in the internet that we should not recreate. <clears throat> Since the internet was built by trusting graduate students it had no security Ideologically, we wouldn't even inspect source addresses in packets. I think it's an ideological problem. We thought that that was an invasion of privacy somehow. Anyway, that, that oversight, the inspection of source addresses in packets, has led to all, almost all the security problems that we have on the internet. It's a bug we, we are still fixing today. In the upper right, 
I'll remind you that in 1972, our goal in life was to carry a seven-bit character across the United States and back in under a half a second. That was the spec. But now we carry HD. Now we carry not only video downloads and not only streaming video, we're now beginning to carry interactive video. So these are megabits per second with latencies in the uh, fractions of a second. So the quality of the service of the internet has always been a challenge as we've put much more traffic on than it was designed to carry and we've been upgrading the plumbing all along. And finally, economics, since once again, since it was, the internet was built by grad students for, for whom everything is free, uh, there was no economics put in the internet. So we've been struggling to put inter, uh, economics in the internet. Currently, advertising is the current um, method of paying for the internet. Now here's a surprise. Now this is much less of a surprise today than it was before the mortgage bubble burst. So, so the mortgage bubble has erased all memories of this bubble bursting. But that is the, those are, st uh, internet's, those are stock prices. And the bubble burst, I think it was March 11th, 2000, right, or something, or 2000, one of those years. That came as a very big surprise. Now, notice that if you subtract that spike, there is sort of straight growth. There was sort of a speculative surge, but the growth of the, the internet was pretty steady through that period, even though the stock skyrocketed. Is there a lesson here for energy? Yes, energy has bubbles. They burst all the time. Uh, one of them, uh, well, we've, we went through the biofuels bubble. We've been through a few solar bubbles. Um, global warming is a bubble. How do I know that global warming is a bubble? How do I know? <laughs> Al Gore and I inflated, arm in arm, we went around the world inflating the internet bubble together. I know. He's back. <laughs> <laughs> this bubble may have already burst. Actually, the term global warming is now um, falling out of use, and we're calling it, what do we call it? Weird climate change or something. And a bunch of companies that were invested in, in the hysteria about the urgency that was projected by global warming, uh, the, they're um, in trouble now. A lot of investments were foolishly made in the hysteria associated with the bubble. Now, when the internet was a bubble, I think I've already made the point, the internet was growing through the bubble. I am quite certain Earth is getting warmer through this period, but on top of that, there was, a, there was or maybe still is, a, a speculative bubble. And there's some lessons to learn. There will be bubbles in energy. I'm about to argue there should be bubbles in energy. By the way, I've been to, this is a digression, I've been to the top of Kilimanjaro. That is a glacier. It's melting. That's a puddle of glacier melt at my feet. Of course, the, uh, the odd details, that ice is only 11,000 years old, and the mountain is only, uh, that crater is only 100,000 years old, so maybe we don't learn a lot from this experience. But I'm telling you, the Earth is getting warmer. I could see it. Uh, so I am not what they call a denier. So when you uh, have an a inquisitorial velocity, you use language like deniers. These are deniers. These people we disagree with are deniers. I'm not denying that the earth is getting hot. I'm just telling you there's a bubble there and we should be careful of bubbles. Oh. But the, tr the switcheroo here is that the internet teaches that bubbles are good. So we're talking now about tools of innovation. The internet was a big innovation. The status quo, IBM and AT&T personifying the status quo. They turned out to be resourceful, nasty people. The innovators had to fight and we had tools and one of our tools was speculative bubbles. So I'm reporting that we should not make bubbles illegal. The impulse after every bubble burst is to run to Washington and make the last bubble illegal. We're doing that now in, uh, with the mortgage bubble. It's probably not a good idea. What the internet has taught me is that these bubbles are a tool of innovation. They accelerate innovation, and to the extent you make bubbles illegal or uh, regulate them, you're actually slowing down innovation and you're giving more tools to the status quo. And speaking of laws, uh, the, 
internet had some interesting laws. And I don't mean laws like laws of physics. I mean laws like Moore's law. Have you all heard of Moore's law? Seriously, have you all heard of Moore's law? So uh, before Moore's law, there was a law called Grosch's law. Herb Grosch was an IBM executive, and he had data. And his data, when sprayed on a semi-log chart, showed that the cost of a computer went up as the square root of its computational power. And what's the consequence of that law? You should build bigger and bigger computers because the cost is only going up as the square root of their power, and then you can share their power with ever larger numbers of people and get economies of scale. And then Moore came along and came along with Moore's law, which basically said, I'm paraphrasing, small computers are better. And the Moore's people were in Silicon Valley, and the Grosch people were on the East Coast, principally in New England. So that's why the impetus of, of startup and innovation moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. Because the East Coast got stuck in Grosch's law and started building computer utilities. Multics comes to mind. You don't even remember Multics. You know Unix? Unix was a joke on the preceding operating system that was called Multics. So they, and they laughed at Multics. So, by the way, I've just explained why the impetus of innovation went to Silicon Valley from New England is because of the laws. They chose the wrong laws. We chose Grosch's Law on the East Coast, and then we chose Moore's Law on the West Coast, and the rest is history. So will there be laws for energy? Are they useful? They are useful. Moore's Law, for example, wasn't a law of physics. It was an agenda-setting law. Every year, we would go to work, and we'd say, what do we have to do this year to make Gordon right again? So we would invest in lithography, and we'd invest in pure material science, and this and that. And Moore's law is, since 1965, has been numerically true. I had a law, Metcalfe's law. I'm gonna, this is the first book I'm going to write as a professor. The title is Metcalfe's Law. Um, Metcalfe's law and Moore's law have something in common. They both begin with M. My law has never been numerically true. Uh, it's, it's a vision thing, but uh, so I'll, I'll deal with that in the forthcoming book. Energy could use some laws. Now, I think I'm on the trail of an energy law here. So Professor Sachs at MIT has been plotting the installed cost of electricity in dollars per kilowatt hour for a while, and his chart goes back quite a ways. Uh, it goes back to the 70s. And so what he's done is list various advances in photovoltaics and put them on a chart, and it's, it's, it's um, a straight line, almost. And if you take this straight line, if you call it, now Professor Sachs doesn't call it Sachs Law, I call it Sachs Law. You're not allowed to name the law after yourself. So um, you have to get somebody else, take them to dinner, and have them name the law after you. So, so since I'm an investor in his company, uh, I call this Sachs Law. And you'll notice that he's projecting that photovoltaics will eventually become cheaper than coal. And that would be a solution, a big solution to our energy problems as soon as we could get photovoltaics economic cheaper, not only the natural gas, which is the new, the new um, um, price to beat, but coal after that. Also speaking of laws, this is an aerial photograph of Washington, D.C. And what the internet has taught me anyway is that Washington, D.C. is a pro-am. And innovators are the AMs. So when you go to Washington, say, for biofuels to get good stuff, you end up often with the wrong stuff. So you need to be careful about it. You'll often hear the speech, we need to develop political will. We need to go to Washington, and we need to get Washington to do this, and this, and this, and you end up with corn ethanol. <laughs> or worse, you end up with the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy was founded in the 70s by Jimmy Carter. Its purpose was to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Its annual budget has passed $25 billion a year a long time ago. And how are we doing on our dependence on foreign oil? That mission has not been met. We went to Washington to solve our dependence on foreign oil, and we got stuck with the Department of Energy. The other thing I hold against the Department of Energy is that it used to be called the Atomic Energy Commission. It's been in existence for 30 years. We have, in the United States, 104 nuclear power plants, all of which are older than 30 years. We've not had a new nuclear power plant in 30 years. I blame this on the Department of Energy. 
So when you go to Washington, the evidence is you need to be careful because it's where the status quo lives. They have all the lawyers and the litigators and the lobbyists, and you go to Washington and it is a pro-am. There is some good news. Nuclear appears to be coming back. Even President Obama is in favor of nuclear. I've seen five startups who are now coming with small reactors. So there the model is reminiscent of the internet, where we started with big mainframes, $15 billion nuclear reactors, and then we ended up with personal computers, which are small in this analogy, small nuclear reactors. So the, if there are several startups now proposing nuclear reactors as big as this table, which, by the way, can generate um, 25 megawatts for 10 years. Uh, inexpensively if manufactured properly. Uh, so, it is, so there is some uh, good news. And by the way, that's a photograph of the inside of a nuclear reactor, and I should just ask you, what color is that? Green. Is that green? Burn <laughs> but it's burn orange, right. Now, actually, Washington did help the internet, and I hasten to now go through a list of the things that Washington did for the internet, because we can hope that they'll do similar. Washington, whoever those people are, can um, do the same for energy. Uh, and it looks like it's going this way. So I'm not, it's not as if I'm a voice crying in the wilderness here. It looks like it's going this way. So the government the federal government, demonopolized telecommunications and computing. The FCC and the Justice Department broke the back of the AT&T and IBM monopolies, and that paved the way for the Internet. The government set standards for the Internet. Actually, it made two of them, but two is a big improvement over the 20 that pre-existed, so, and one of them eventually won the TCP IP protocols of the Internet. The government, the federal government, the Defense Communications Agency, was a early customer of the modern packet switches. It bought, placed the first big orders with uh, the early suppliers, thereby jump-starting the market. But what is the most important thing that the federal government did for the Internet? It sponsored research. So I think research is what the federal government does best. Um, because only monopolies can afford research, and the government is the big monopoly in the sky. So where should we do our research? Should we do it at corporations like Bell Labs, Xerox PARC, Microsoft Research? Should we do it at corporations? The evidence uh, in, the ex in the Internet is that once again, research can only be done by mono monopolies, and we can't afford monopolies. Monopolies get their money by overcharging their customers, and that's not a good thing. We need to maintain competition, I think. So maybe we shouldn't rely on Bell Labs coming back by creating some new monopoly that can afford to have Bell Labs. So if not uh, private company labs, where should research be done? I'm talking about research now, not development. Where should research be done? How about government labs? How about the many labs of the Department of Energy, like Los Alamos? And there's usually, when I say this, there's usually somebody who either is currently working at Los Alamos or is recently left Bell Labs. In any case, the DOE labs are earmarks. They're geographical earmarks. They all have two senators and a bevy of uh, uh, congressmen attached. And they are jobs programs, and their intellectual output, it's positive, but it's not the best use of research dollars, in my experience. So where should the money be invested? That is, the government should be sponsoring research, because only monopolies can afford research. And I think the internet teaches us that research should be done at research universities. Uh, this is, uh, I told you this was the, 42nd edition of my previous editions, this was a picture of MIT, but it's now a picture of uh, <laughs> Texas. There's about, I estimate, about 100 good research universities in the United States that can be relied upon to do energy research, and that's where we should be investing the money, not in DOE labs, not in corporate labs, but in research universities. The reason that research universities are where we should be investing is because they graduate students. And these students are the best vehicles, in my experience, for innovation. They bring the new knowledge. Now, there's a professor involved. And I, I, I try to take naps while they work. Yes. 
Well, I'm going to have to dig into this particular nuance about uh, professors versus grad students. I'll think on that. Now, one thing you'll hear from, uh, I've often heard from, and I'll get back to professors in a moment, but one thing you'll often hear from energy graybeards who are, uh, have been working in energy a very long time and they are very familiar with all the difficulties involved in energy. They will tell you, you've heard it before, there are no silver bullets. There are no silver bullets. Well, if you look at the history of the internet, there were silver bullets. Dense wave division multiplexing was a silver bullet. Around the middle 90s, they figured out how to put 80 channels of, uh, uh, well, 10, 20, 30, 40 gigabits per second on each wavelength of light. Prior to that, I remember when I would dr I'd drive from New York to Massachusetts to go to college, and my mom would say, when you get to Massachusetts, give me a call so I know you're safe. Let the phone ring three times and then hang up. I love you, but I don't love you that much. <laughs> but thanks to dense wave division multiplexing, no one thinks like that anymore. I mean, people are calling, every, they're texting, uh, communicating all the time, and it's due to a particular silver bullet. I consider it the silver bullet in the internet, dense wave division multiplexing. But there were others. TCP IP is a silver bullet. The three standards of the World Wide Web that Tim Berners-Lee came up with in 1989, those are a silver bullet. There are going to be silver bullets, plural, in energy, and we should look for them. In fact, we should demand them. In fact, these uh, professors that you're complaining about, we should demand that they come up with some silver bullets instead of spending so much time telling us that there will be no silver bullet. Now, here's a particular silver bullet. This is arguably the internet company, Cisco. It was founded by um, those two Stanford researchers on the left, uh, then in came a, a wizened, uh, experienced startup guy, John Mobridge on the top, and a venture capitalist, Don Valentine, showed up, and they built that company from, the, from almost nothing. This is Akamai. This one happens to be uh, a company out of, although I wasn't there at the time, my venture capital firm. The man on the right, George Conradius, was the president of IBM USA, and then he became a startup CEO. The professors at the top, Tom Layton, a mathematician, and the, his two grad students uh, on the bottom left created Akamai, which delivers much of the content of the internet today. And Google, the professors on the left, an experienced uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, founder of Sun, over here. The, uh, the two grad students, the uh, experienced scaling entrepreneur, Eric Schmidt in the middle, and then the voracious venture capitalists on the right. Uh, they built. The internet was built by teams like this, consisting of research professors, graduating students, scaling entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and I'll go on, strategic partners and early adopters. Fiercely competing teams of roughly that makeup is what built the internet. I expect that that's what's going to build the internet, as it's going to solve energy. IBM and AT&T did not build the internet. They were built by companies like this. Now, I have uh, 26 minutes. I'm now going to turn really technical. Well, not really technical. Anyway, this is a picture of the energy system of the United States. You're not supposed to read anything. You're just supposed to say, wow, that's complicated. <laughs> and it is. So we, we need to change that system. We need to um, convert it to providing an abundance of cheap and clean energy. So what did the internet do? The internet began by developing an architecture, a design. So computer scientists uh, with some of the best taste, computer scientists actually use the word taste. We have taste in our algorithms and tastes in our designs. And so an architecture of the internet was designed almost at the very beginning. It took a couple of years of thrashing around. And one of the features of that architecture is this, what we in the trade call the seven-layer model that took all the complexity of the internet and said, we're going to just divide it into layers. And we're going to spend some time defining the interfaces among these layers. And then the world can go out and innovate. And that's what happened. So by trading these layers, each of those technology levels, like the speed of Ethernet, 
the speed of Ethernet went from 2 megabits to 10 to 100 to a gig. It's 100 gig today. So technological progress was occurring at this layer right here. Meanwhile, completely independently, other things were being invented at other layers. So one of the benefits of this layering was uh, to let technologies proceed at their own pace without getting tangled up in a highly verticalized structure. The coolest thing about this for me, though, was that in the design of those layered interfaces where that taste was exercised, the art, uh, these generalized interfaces between the layers were designed, and that created an environment for serendipity. So for example, Ethernet, which I mentioned was invented in 73, along with the, the layers 3 and 4, TCP and IP. So they say they were invented in 73. The World Wide Web was invented in 89. And it worked. And, and then Google came along in, I forget what year, 94, 98. And then now we have Facebook. And Ethernet's still there. And TCP IP are still there. And now different versions of them, and they've enhanced. So, so creating an architecture and, and pr creating these boundaries and then building standards within the layers, that is what work. We should be doing the same thing for energy. Now, there is an impulse to do the IBM. I'm talking now about the old IBM vertical thing, where one company does everything. Makes the chips, makes the computers, writes the software, makes the applications, sell them. And then there's the disaggregated model, which this represents, which is probably, it's a model that worked for the internet, it's likely to work for energy. Another argument, argument by analogy is if you look at the left, you see the kinds of computers that existed at the beginning of the internet, mainframe IBM computers with tape memory. At the bottom, you see a microprocessor. That happened during the building of the internet. If the internet is any guide, the same thing will happen in energy. We'll, we're starting with those behemoth power plants, and we will, if the internet is any guide, work our way down to distributed energy generation and management. If you have distributed energy, you need to think about the network that's going to connect it all together, connect all the supplies of energy with all the sources. Now, the supplies are becoming more random. And the uses are becoming more random, and the network has to be different. The network we have today mostly uh, distributes uh, energy. That is, it's generated at the coal plant, and, and the term they use, it's distributed. That's a different use of the word distributed than internet people talk about. We talk about distributed energy, meaning energy has to be exchanged, not simply distributed. So if the internet is any guide, we're going to move to different networking styles. In fact, you, you might argue, I will argue, that the best way to look at energy, the big problem of energy, you can look at it as thermodynamics, you can look at it as public policy, but probably the best lens to use is to view it as a networking problem. We have to network these evolving sources to these evolving sinks of energy in some method, a network of exchange. There is a, a an effort to build the smart grid. We have one of the world's experts in the room. I won't embarrass him further. Uh, there is an impulse from the utilities that they need to build a new network because the internet is, is unreliable and too slow or too expensive or it isn't everywhere yet. So, and so you often hear the argument, therefore, we're going to have to build another network that we're going to own. And the internet teaches that that's probably a bad idea. That idea has occurred several times in the decades that passed. And every time, it would turned out to be better to fix whatever's wrong with the internet rather than start over and build a new network. So that's the point I'm trying to make here. The smart grid should probably be built on the internet instead of some other network that the utilities are pursuing. Another technical observation, when the uh, internet was first started, the telecommunications network was synchronous. In order to tap into the telephone network, you had to listen to the clock ticking, and then you had to come up to speed, and then you had to get synchronized with the clock, and then you could put your voice communications through it. Well, that's a good description of the energy network today. We have this, to make a long story short, 60 hertz going around, and to put energy onto the grid, you've got to wait for the cycle, and you've got to get synchronized. And there's a whole industry, a billion-dollar industry, providing devices that help you synchronize with the clock. Well, if the internet is any guide, when we're done building the smart grid, it won't be synchronous anymore. That's just too fragile and too difficult. So that the, uh, we will be 
if the, I'm taking now the analogy very far, we will now go to power packet switching, where, which is completely asynchronous and might even be direct current, we'll see. Another thing that occurred in the internet is at the very beginning when you put data into the telecommunication system, it popped out the other side in less than 100 milliseconds. There was no storage, little or no storage in the net. Well, does that describe the internet today? No. The internet has been storified. There's storage everywhere. Uh, the packet switches have storage. The servers have storage. You have storage in your pockets. And one of the things that storage does is it moderates randomness. So if you have randomness of supply and randomness of demand, you put some storage in between and it smooths things out. So we can expect, so at the top of this you see the mag tapes that we started with, the core memories that we moved to, the hard disks that we went, moved to, and a bunch of other different kinds of storage. Well the same is going to happen for energy. So right now we're storing energy by pumping water uphill, which is, uh, actually works amazingly. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries, uh, they were invented around here somewhere. Does everyone know the lithium battery was, I only learned this in the, the current month. The, the inventor is here at Texas. Uh, and then maybe hydrogen. So there'll be many forms of storage. When we're done solving energy, the internet will be full of storage. So for example, in my own, res uh, my own venture capital firm, we've invested in four energy storage companies. They're completely different, compressed air, lithium ions, um, hydrogen, because we think there'll be many kinds of storage before we solve energy. The internet did not really occur until there were local area networks. That is, bringing bandwidth to a building was, turned out to be a small fraction of the problem. And as soon as the building was full of computers and they were all communicating with each other, that's when the internet took off. So by analogy, we can assume the same will occur in energy. So we won't be done with the smart grid until it gets behind the meter. So the power companies, in a regulated sort of way, deliver their energy up to the smart meter. And then there's that house behind it, or that commercial building behind it. And if the internet is any guide, the smart grid isn't going anywhere until those networks get installed, uh, energy networks get installed in buildings, uh, by analogy. So let me uh, close with a completely exciting and interesting game that you're invited to play. When the internet was being built, and remember, I was there, nobody said, we're building the internet to make YouTube possible. <laughs> remember, it was a seven-bit character we were trying to carry across the United States. Nobody, I, I can assure you, I went to all the meetings, nobody ever said, <laughs> We're building this to upload our videos of our personal interactions. So what will be energy's YouTubes? That is, if we solve energy and we have a squanderable abundance of it, as I'm predicting in decades, cheap and clean, what would we use all that energy for? So that's the game, is to kind of brainstorm, and I've done some. What would you use a, a, a lot of energy for? Well, for one thing, energy is a factor of production. I don't have, the, I don't have this quantified yet, but I'm looking for an, what do they call econometrician who can tell me, if you took the cost of energy down a factor of 10 over the next 50 years, what would that do to the economy? My hunch is it would bring uh, higher levels of, uh, higher standards of living and prosperity. So that would be one use of a lot of energy, and we'll, uh, once again, that's on my to-do list, is to figure out just, Without changing anything, just making energy cheaper, what would be the economic impact of that? We've recently performed the inverse experiment. We had a, um, a real estate boom going, and then suddenly energy hit $140 per barrel. And I don't know what the mechanism was, but right after that, the economy crashed. And it, so the, the, the uh, energy became expensive, the prosperity flattened out, and that revealed this house of cards surrounding uh, mortgages. Uh, so we perform the experiment, you raise energy prices, the economy goes down. Uh, I think the converse is probably true. If we can get energy to be cheap and clean, uh, the economy will go up. This is my friend Charles Simonyi. He wrote Microsoft Word. He's a billionaire. 
He's been to the International Space Station twice. It cost him $30 million each time. Uh, however, that's in the year 2010. What if you went out 65 years? What about space travel? So I went to the company that sent Charles to the space station, and I sat down with the CEO, and we took out an envelope. You know, that where all the world's important calculations are done on the back of an envelope. And we calculated how much energy it would take if there were 10 billion people in 65 years, and if 5% of them went to the moon and back or migrated to Mars, either one, it's about the same energy, uh, how much energy would that take? And we calculated that it's on the order of 500 exajoules, which is on the order of all the, ener all the energy that the human race uses today. So it's on the same order of magnitude. Now, there will be some technological advances that were not represented in that envelope, but that would use a lot of energy, space travel. And it's coming. Which, by the way, Charles is going to the moon next. So the, the, what they're going to do is get him into orbit and then send some fuel up there and then send him around the moon and back and then land him back down again. But you could you can go ahead of Charles if you want. You just need $100 million. Another thought I had for energy was, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of personalized medicine in the future. We're going to be scanning people. We're going to be sequencing them. And I haven't done the math. I have a feeling that this is not a major energy use because it's done so lightly with computers and scanners. But that's new, and that, that is a damn good use of energy. Water. Water's a problem. Millions of people die every year because they don't have clean water. That's a big problem. What if we gave everybody the US standard of water in 65 years, 400 liters per day, clean, a potable water? Let's say we did it the old-fashioned way by boiling it. Uh, I've done the math. It turns out to be 7.6 times the amount of energy that we, the whole human race uses today. It's been pointed out by many other people that we're probably not going to boil it. So the number will come down. But as a back of the envelope calculation, that would be a damn good use of energy is if we could get clean water to everybody. Water and energy are like this. And then there's this final use on my list. So if global warming is a problem and you're worried about it and there's CO2, too much 385 parts per million in the atmosphere and it's going up, this professor has a device that takes atmospheric CO2 out of the atmosphere. It just takes energy. So if you give him enough energy, he'll remove all the CO2 you want from the atmosphere when he's done with his research, I mean. And maybe he needs some graduate students helping him. But your car will be electric by then anyway. And that electricity won't be. Oh, that's powered by coal anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so by the way, he's done the math. If you took some coal and you burned it, and you produced energy, you take 10% of that energy would be needed to remove the CO2 that's produced by burning the coal. So you end up ahead. Once again, this is a, a research prototype and needs some scaling up. But that would be another good use of energy is to solve the global warming problem. And you're invited to uh, generate your own ideas about how we're going to use energy. <laughs> Professor Metcalf, thank you very much. Thank you.